Hi, thanks for coming. I am used to having to turn cartwheels to get people to my talks because people see documentation and they go, oh my god. So if you're here because your boss said you had to come to a documentation talk, thank you. I hope you will accidentally enjoy yourself. <laughs> Otherwise, um, yeah, hopefully the bribery worked. So I understand it's the last session. I understand we're all tired and we want to go home. Uh, I do too. I get that. I brought chocolate. If you fall asleep, I promise to throw a Lindor ball at your head. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that would happen somehow. Um, so very quickly, so I want to spend five or ten minutes just talking, just, just sort of giving you a bit of a, a brief before we get to the fun stuff. So I'm sorry, you do have to sit through the boring bit. Um, first of all, I just want to talk about why I've called this an unexpected journey through agile documentation. And partly it's just because I'm a nerd and Tolkien's cool. Um, but partly also because unex an unexpected journey through agile documentation is exactly what I have been doing over the past few years. This is me. This is me a few years ago. I don't often put up pictures of myself. I don't tend to like photos of me, but I'll, I'll run with it for now. Uh, this is me giving a talk in Cincinnati at the Open Help Conference, which is a giant nerd conference for, for documentation people who document stuff in open source. And there's not a lot of us. So when I say giant, it's kind of like 10 people in a room. <laughs> so when I gave this talk, and many talks before it, welcome, hi. Um, I, was doing, I, I was doing talks about documentation. It was a very waterfall-based method. And it's very simple to write a book, right? You sit down and you start at the beginning and you keep on writing until you run out of things to say. So it has a beginning and it has a middle and it has an end. Waterfall documentation and waterfall development models are very, very simple at their, at their basic. So you start at the top, you, you, you do your, the, the first thing, your planning or whatever, and then that gives you the inputs to start the next thing. And so you sort of pop out at the end with some kind of a product. However, the, the, the reason why Waterfall works for documentation is because we have this book paradigm. It's very, even though very little documentation these days is actually printed on bits of dead tree, we still have this idea of what a book is. It still has a beginning and an end. It still has concept material in the beginning. It has reference material at the end. It still has a contents page. Sometimes it has an index. And even though we've sort of made some of these things a bit more technology, they're still very much like this, this original book paradigm. And that's what made it really hard when agile stuff started coming in. And I started working with a development team that was using Agile development, and I, I was still very focused. I, like I said, I'd spoken at conferences for years about waterfall documentation methods, and I was still very, very focused on this waterfall method. And it was really hard for me to start breaking this idea of, of a book. Hi, come in, sit down. So Agile development, so I, I want to start with just a quick definition of what I talk about. When, it, when I say the term Agile development, I'm using a very, very broad term. I'm talking about any kind of development for software, hardware, anything you're making, as long as you're doing it in iterations. So if you've got three, four, five, even a two-week sprint or a longer sprint, if, if you've got something at the end of that sprint that could, you know, at least hypothetically be released, then that is a, an agile system in the sense that I'm using it. So here I'm talking about agile documentation as opposed to Agile development. And it was, it was really, really hard for me to start getting into Agile, agile documentation. Quite, quite simply, Agile documentation should not even be a thing. It shouldn't work this way. Books are very linear. And <laughs> it, it <coughs> was really very difficult for me to sort of get away from this linear thing and to, and to break this paradigm. And around about the same time I was trying to work out this stuff, I, so I have to tell you a story about the very first Agile project I tried to document. And <laughs> um, when, when you do uh, my first Agile project, and you, I sort of came to the conclusion that there are two ways that you can document in a traditional manner for an Agile project. You can either decide that you, you know what developers are actually going to do in the future, and you can sit down and start making some stuff up. Or you, you can... You can wait till the developer, developer actually does those things and then do all your research and get it written and, and, and uh, review it and make sure it's right. And you'll probably end up delivering a beautiful book, but it will probably also be three months late. So there didn't seem to be a good opportunity. And at the, at the time, topic-based authoring was a, was a big buzzword in the technical communication industry. And so we were talking a lot about topic-based authoring. And in the end, that ended up... And the reason I've got the pictures of the padlocks here, other than the fact that they're kind of cute, um, is because this really ended up being the, the key to unlock the, the Agile development problem for me. So what I want to do is run through a really, really quick introduction to topic-based authoring, 
and then we're going to get into the, into the fun stuff. Okay, so topic-based authoring. Topic-based authoring is about the idea of bringing this information, rather than having lengthy prose-style information, we break it down into nice manageable chunks. And so every piece of information, so this isn't talking about chapters, this isn't talking about sections, it's talking about paragraphs at the absolute most, sometimes sentences. Every single piece of information you write down on a page needs to answer one of these three questions. So the three questions are what is it, how do I do it, and what else do I need to know? So what is it, this is what we call a concept. Perfect example, penguin is a flightless bird. So this is answering the question, what is it? What the hell is this thing? Why do I want it? So how do I do it? This is a task. This is quite often a set of steps. It's, um, it, my, my example here is that it's an action. Okay? This is something that the, the user has to do. And finally, what else do I need to know? This is a piece of reference information. Quite often this is a table. Tables are used a lot in reference information. And a really good example is the error codes. If you've got a list of error codes for your program, stick it in a table, we'll pop it in the end, and this is, this is reference information. So everything has to follow one of, one of these three things. So this bit is very important. I want you to try and remember this bit because I'm going to keep on talking about this quite a lot. Okay, so how this works. What I want you to do now is pull out your devices. A laptop or a tablet is best. A phone is okay if you've got, if you, if you've got that. If you can type on it, though, that is best. So a tablet or, or a laptop is absolutely perfect. This URL will take you to a Google Docs page, which I've created, and I'll bring that up live so we can, we can watch our document taking place. We're going to run three 10-minute sprints. This is, hopefully this works. If we only get two in, that's fine. Uh, we're going to do a code review at the end of each sprint. So when I say code, I put it in inverted commas because it's not really code. Obviously, it's actually bits of Lego. So. Uh, we're also going to do continuous integration of the documentation. So anyone who's been in an OpenStack talk this week has probably heard the term continuous integration by now. Um, in terms of documentation, this is about we're just going to continue. We're going to continue putting this in. We're going to continue integrating every single word. We're not going to stop and go through a review process or anything like that. Every single time you change something that's already there, all you need to do is think, is this better than what was there before? OK, so I need a development team. Who would like to be on my LEGO development team? I need about three of you. One, two, three. Let's go. Come down here. So my development team have a design spec. <coughs> The design spec is to build a vehicle for, for penguins to move their eggs around. It needs to be fully enclosed because it's cold in Antarctica. It needs to be a uniform cover, cover for camouflage. And I was going to make a gag about polar bears, but my daughter is, is, is right, really geeky into this kind of stuff, and she would absolutely give me a hard time about the fact that there are no polar bears in the same place as there are penguins. So um, it must fit at least three penguins and their eggs. It must be all-terrain, because there's no roads in Antarctica. And we really don't want to kill any penguins in the making. So documentation team, that's you guys, with all your devices open. I want you to describe what it does, not just what it looks like. It's very, very easy to, take a, to, to look at a Lego creation. Oh, yes, it's a small Lego creation. That's not exactly what we're looking for. Um, we want to know how your users will be approaching this product. So users are the penguins, remember. We want the penguins to walk up, and the first thing they're going to do is go, oh, where do I put my egg? Right? Think about how your users are approaching this problem. It's OK to make stuff up. It's OK to make stuff up in this scenario, obviously, because the whole thing we're making up. But it's also OK to make this stuff up in real life. Because quite frankly, if you don't have information on a page and you ask someone if that's right, they'll go, hmm. If you have the wrong stuff on that page, they will tell you, and they will tell you fast. And they will tell you in great detail. And it's the best way to get information out of developers. And so, concept task reference. I did say that was important, and I'm going to say it again. Concept task reference. Everything needs to fit into one of those three topics. So, here's the URL again. I'm going to open that up too. Oh my goodness, are you accidentally enjoying yourself? <laughs> Uh, sorry, I just realized I forgot something. The, the link, the bit.ly is there. I hope you can read it there. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate this. I love doing this. I really do.
<laughs> six chocolate eggs. Of course you do. Did your change make it better, whoever made that comment, Sam? <laughs> oh, well, we need to have a blue one. Yeah, make it nine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. So, I would like to start my timer. So, we've got 10 minute sprints. So, we're off. So, do you remember your design spec or do you want me to flick back a little bit? Let me flick back briefly. So it's a vehicle for daddy penguins to move their eggs, must be fully enclosed, it must be a uniform colour, it must fit at least... I think as long as it's a uniform colour from outside. Uh, it must fit at least three penguins in their eggs, it must be all terrain, and please don't kill any penguins in the making. Uh, remember, of course, this is a design spec too. So we're talking from a customer perspective. There are things that they're going to rate higher on this list than other things. And that's a decision that the, the development team are going to have to make as they go along. They might not be able to meet all this criteria. Okay, so let's get into documentation. What have we got already? Because you guys look like you've gotten a lot busier than previous groups I've done this with. So... <laughs> So the, 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 in the first sprint, what we want to do is focus on the concepts, because the concepts are the easiest thing, and they're the thing we can actually do at the moment, because we can base it on the design spec. We've got the same information as the development team right now. So we don't know what they're working on. They're, they're working away in, in their basement, wherever they are, and <laughs> they're doing their own thing. We need to try and, and actually predict what's going to go on in this first sprint at this point. So a lot of this will be information gathering, be working from design documents and things that previously existed, working from plans, and hopefully actually talking to engineers in the hallways and that kind of stuff as well. Now with your concepts, please make sure you're using full sentences. It's really important. So Lindor Balls is not a concept, it's a thing. It doesn't answer the question, what is it, right? So what we need to say is this, this, this is a, a vehicle that will carry Lindor balls or something like that. So we'll actually try and make these actual sentences if we can. This is just fantastic. Yeah. Oh, I've <laughs> I love Google Docs. I, I keep telling people about Google Docs, you know, interactive, people around the world, blah, blah, blah. But this just blows your mind. <laughs> <laughs> this is much better. I, I actually keep all, my do all, all the docs that are written just for my own personal amusement because every so often I like to go back and read them. Is this actually something you would do on the job? Yes, this is absolutely something we would do on the job. Um, obviously, in, in most cases, we're working in XML or something like that. Uh, there, there would probably be a C CMS behind it. I am trying to keep this talk as technology um, agnostic as I possibly can. Yes. And fixing, yes. Yes, the, the, the live editing is absolutely amazing. And yes, Etherpads and Google Docs and all these live editing tools that we've got are absolutely essential to, to these kinds of projects, especially in the very early stages. My, la my tablet keeps dying, so I can't see the time. OK, so we're about halfway through our first sprint. Um, so definitely keep on coming on with these con concepts and come back to your design spec. So remember we had things about camouflage and we had things about being, pr being protected from... Um, uh, we had, had, yes, we had things about warmth, we had the all-terrain tyres, we had things about being protected from predators. So make sure you put some stuff like that in there. Yes, eggs are fragile. That's, that's good. That's really good background information. That's something that the user absolutely needs to know before they get in there. Admittedly, they might know it themselves, but, you know, for the, for the sake of the argument. I'm curious that you're in a situation where several people would be writing documentation on the same subject at the same time. Yeah, so that's a really interesting part of topic-based authoring. Um, quite a lot of the time, topics do get written as simultaneous, and it's really important when you go to write a topic, especially if it's a new one, that you go and search the database and make sure that someone hasn't written it before you. Um, this, this, this has become an, an interesting situation in, in places where I've worked previously and the actual CMS that handles the topics, it's really important that we can really search that and, and be very active with things like metadata. So what we do is attach metadata to topics so that we understand what the product is, what version it is, 
um, whether it's uh, what audience is reading it. So if there's a difference between developers and sysadmins and end users, um, we can add metadata to topics to, to indicate that. So that when you go search through, you can then pick out the topics that are important to you. Similarly, when you're building the book, similarly when you're building the book, what you can then do, because you've got the topics, Okay, then you're not, you're not actually sitting down and writing this book from scratch. What you do then is you take your metadata again. You go, I want to see all the installation information for this particular product, version 2. You can then get your CMS to spit out those topics and you can arrange them into a reasonably logical order. And we can actually have robots put it into order for us as well. Because we know that most chapters should have the order of concept task reference, we can actually take the we can tell the, tell, tell the robots to put that together for us in that correct order. So we can see the concept followed by the related tasks, followed by the related reference information. All the writers have to do is write their topics. The audience for this document is the penguins. End users? And the end users, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know how localization works, to be honest. I don't speak Penguin fluently. Um, my daughter is a massive Penguin fan, though, so possibly she'd be able to help us out. We could, we could bring in some, some external help to help us, help us translate this. Uh, please remember, we've got a lot of background information, but we don't have a lot of... Ooh, something died. Oh. <laughs> you now know what I call my laptop. <laughs> I still don't want to know. I'm a Big Bang Theory fan. <laughs> Go Team Leonard. Um, so yeah, so make sure we've actually got concepts. We haven't talked much about the vehicle itself at this point. So I think we can probably make some reasonable assumptions about what colour the thing might be. Uh, we can probably make some reasonable assumptions. I don't think we've mentioned anything about the all-terrain tyres at yeah. this point. Oh, we have. My apologies. It is there. Wow, you guys are so prolific. It's amazing. I wish I was this prolific. It would take me days to write that much. <laughs> that, that, that probably has something to do with the fact that I research things. Absolutely. I reckon this is a great idea. I'm onto it. <laughs> I have a new documentation totally idea. Are there more than um, I, I actually I, I do normally mention this that the, the numbers are slightly skewed in this example. <laughs> we, we don't tend to have this kind of ratio. For, it should be the other way. You should all be sitting around there. And should be no, you guys should all be sitting around arguing about what colour the thing's going to be. <laughs> well, While the documentation people get on with the job. <laughs> so, is that how it works? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think our sprint is just about up. Yes, but it will, be, it will begin as a requirement spec. So, so the comment was that it's a requirement spec, not a piece of documentation. That's absolutely correct, because that's the only information we've got to work on. We don't have anything other than requirements at this point to talk about. So we've got to base our ideas on requirements. So remember it's fun. <laughs> thank you. I, 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 thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so yes, absolutely. But remember it's okay to make assumptions. So start writing about what this thing might be, because we've, we can iterate over this. Remember that whatever we write, with any assumptions we make now, once we've seen our code review from our developers at the end of the sprint, we can then go back and fix it. So remember what I said, it's okay to make stuff up. It's okay to write fiction. And the first draft of any technical manual is always mostly fiction. I am very, very good at doing things like, and this thing will have this feature where it does this stuff, and then you just put a big fix me, go ask the developer. So, <laughs> You, you do come back and, and I actually would actually argue that the terrain types are reference information. So whoever's writing that piece, I would actually cut and paste it further down into the, into the reference section. The terrain types. And, and the trick here is because you've got bullets. It's very easy to pick out reference information. Yes, up the back. So the three things that, that every topic must be are concept, task and reference. So concept answers, what is it? Task answers, what does it do? Reference answers, what else do I need to know? I, I like the use of the, the question marks here. That's very useful. Um, so generally in tech writing world, we use the term fix me all in caps. 
um, the question marks will work as long as you're standardizing and all your writers are using the same thing so you know to grep through it and find them before you do it. Yes? Uh, that's what I really like about Sphinx because they actually have a to-do item. Yes. So you see all of that at the end on one page and you can very easily go through Absolutely. So, so uh, the point was that the, the, the Sphinx... Um, <laughs> Um, development tool actually actually has a to-do thing. So when you go through the end, you see the list of all the to-do items. Um, I've used systems in the past where you can turn fix me's on or off. And if you turn them on and then build your book, it actually comes up in bright highlighted yellow in the in the built book. So you realise it's there and you can you can bring it back out. Okay, that's the end of our sprint. I'm sorry. No one has made a declaration. This is a vehicle for transporting penguins. Yes, that would probably be a good thing to say. <laughs> Okay, development team and sprint tools down. Can we please have a demonstration of what you have done so far? So we can see here. So it is a bit blurry. I'm sorry for the resolution, but if we can please have our uh, scrum master, who's, who's going to be our scrum master for this round? You miss scrum master. If you could please do a demonstration on the camera for us, that would be great. Gray is the colour, so can some, somebody on my documentation team make a note of that for next sprint? Um, so, yeah, the um, colours are not only grey, they are, they are an Arctic camouflage scheme incorporating black and grey and I should white. be Sorry, I should be micing you, shouldn't I? Um, and um, yeah, as you can see, we are attempting to enclose the... Hang on, I just need to rotate it for the camera. We just need to... Uh, we're attempting to enclose the sides. This far side is nearly complete, and um, we're now proceeding for a demo now. <laughs> um, we don't have the wheels attached now, so it's a bit hard to actually demonstrate mobility, but uh, conceptually, we're the on the right path. The are already in. Yep. <laughs> he, 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 he might lie down, that one. He's quite tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a busy day. Been um, so so uh, what, are your, what, what are your plans for fully enclosing? Um, well, this is, this is part of the roof structure, yet to be fully finalised. Uh, we have uh, a few more components here ready to go in and, um, yeah, something like Excellent. that. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and it's going to have all-terrain wheels, is that correct? Uh, yes, these wheels are fully certified all-terrain ones. <laughs> <laughs> Best you can get. Um, yep. We, um, we chose those over these piddly little ones because these are more all-terrain-y. Lovely. Yep. <laughs> and, and have you killed any penguins so far? Uh, no, although they have been declothed on account of the fact that they were a bit too big when they had their um, <laughs> shawls on, so now oh, they're... Oops, there goes they're, the penguin. They're penguin oh. eggs. Oh. Right. Oh. Um, I think we killed a penguin. <laughs> right, we we, we <laughs> overspect on penguins, so that's good. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm going to reset the timer for our next sprint. I think I've broken my microphone. No, 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 keep going. Oh. Keep going, keep going. There are, there are plenty of chocolates. I, 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 everyone seems to have stayed awake so far. I'm shocked. Are you going to tell us what they're doing afterwards? Because we sort of not yeah, we're going to do things. We're going to do something. It's probably mostly like how software developers work anyway. More or less in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so our second sprint has just started. And for the second sprint, it would... So first of all, what we need to do is iterate over our concepts and ensure that we've gotten this information correct. So we've just had our code review. We, un we understand a little bit more about the system now. We've, we've got our eyeballs on it and we've, we've been able to have a chance to ask some questions of our developers. So you need to iterate over the topics you've already got, ensure those are correct, update them in any way you can and improve them, and also start working on our... Wow, there's an awful lot of this. Um, also start working on our tasks. Um, I like step zero. That's very good. So um, one, one thing I would say about this particular task is that it doesn't have a title yet. What's, what's actually going on here? <laughs> Who wrote that? <laughs> so we, what we need to do is have a set of tasks. So each task will need to have a title. It needs to have a very specific thing that people are trying to do. So if you're trying to put an egg into the vehicle, then we'll need to have a set of tasks, for, presumably, a, a, exactly for that. We'll also have so probably another task, I don't know, for getting in and out of the vehicle 
for uh, if it had, had a, I don't know, if it had a missile system, you'd have to be able to arm the missiles or something like that. So, <laughs> oh, we have that? <laughs> Load eggs into the vehicle, very good. Yeah, this is awesome stuff. Excellent, excellent. So tasks are surprisingly difficult to write. So am I allowed to be reading the doco at this stage? Yes, of course you can. So that says get up to three penguin eggs, which is sufficient. Uh, yes, we did, we did say at least three penguins, didn't we? Three penguins and their eggs, yes. I mean at least. Yeah. <laughs> at least. No. <laughs> That's okay. You you can make that you can make you can make that development decision. That is entirely up to you. <laughs> Just keep trying. Right? Who wrote that? <laughs> so when I when I have done this talk previously, it hurts when I hit you in the head with a chocolate. It doesn't say that the eggs can't smash. Yes, it does. <laughs> I am. I am. So, so when I've done this talk previously, I've, I've run with an entire Hobbit theme. This is the first time I've decided to get the penguins into it, and so it lends itself to amazing hilarity. And I'm really, really happy, actually, that the penguin thing has gone the same way. So this is very awesome. I love it when I try something new and it actually works. Um, so, I mean, I, I have done whole presentations just on writing processes. Um, writing processes is really, really hard. And it feels like it should be easy, right? Because we see processes all the time. And I mean, every single badly translated manual that you get for every single cheap little bit of crap that you buy has steps in it. And it should be easy. It seems really logical. Sometimes, especially with very highly technical things, it can actually be really difficult to work out where one step ends and the next step begins. And things like if you click a button and a, and a box pops up, is the button click and the box popping up two separate steps, or is it one? Ideally, you should always keep a reaction in with the action. But sometimes that can actually mean your steps get really, really long. Sometimes you can find that you get to step four of a process and you've got all these sub-steps. Sometimes you can find you can get to, to step four or five and all of a sudden you're, you're branching out into two possible different things that could be going on. So processes are really, really difficult to write. Um, there are actually... There are logical differences between processes and procedures as well. So you can... <laughs> oh, I love this. It's a Google car. <laughs> Who wrote about driving the vehicle without hands? <laughs> Who's anonymous turtle? Penguins don't have hands. No, they don't. They have wings. <laughs> um, I've forgotten where I was going now. I completely <laughs> lost my train of thought. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so processes and procedures are really, really hard to write. And it's really easy to do silly things like bring in anthropomorphization and that kind of thing. Computers think, apparently. According to every single process I have ever read, computers think. And they don't. They might process stuff. You might give them, give them some information and they take a while. But the computers don't think. And, and those kinds of things come up again and again. Um, you, end, you can end up very easily, um, parallelism is my favourite word, and anyone who's come to any of my talks will have heard that one from me before. Um, and it's really easy, all of a sudden you could change, change tense halfway through, your sentence structure changes. And so processes and procedures are actually remarkably difficult, and if you're interested in this, I, I highly recommend you you're seeking out one of my procedure talks, which I do fairly regularly. And, and I think there's one or two on the internet floating around as well. <laughs> I, I don't even know where to go. <laughs> Who wrote about the legless penguins? <laughs> I've got, oh, I'm sorry, my aim's bad. I've got another whole box here yet, so keep going, guys. <laughs> Is Antarctica bumpy? I believe Antarctica would be very bumpy. Who wrote that? Uh, Own up. Oh, okay, fair, fair call from someone who's been there. <laughs> Who wrote Is Antarctica bumpy? No one's going to own up to that one. <laughs> oh, we've got genetically engineered penguins too. Should I be scrolling? Is there more to this that I'm missing? Okay, so we're driving vehicles to destinations. <laughs> I, I, would, I would argue that this isn't a procedure at this point. Um, this, is, this is actually an admonition. So 
So an admonition is a call out, um, that might be a more familiar term, so it's a note or a warning or something like that, the text will be offset. Sometimes it's a different colour, sometimes it has a little exclamation mark and a yellow triangle or something like that. So an, an, an admonition, um, generally, you know, your notes are things like, you know, they're the gotchas, they're the things that you might not have noticed or that, you know, might be a little bit tricky and that's where bugs not features get, get documented as well. So if you've, you've got a situation where something might be slightly buggy, but we're not going to actually tell you it's a bug, that generally ends up in a note or a warning. So warnings are really, uh, these are the high, this is where data loss could happen. These are the, the most critical things. If there's a potential for losing data, you put it in a warning, and that is it. Never use a warning for anything else. Always put everything else in notes and importance. Yes? Yeah, so, 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 the, so, the, so the point is, I, I mentioned earlier about writing something that may be incorrect in order to provoke a response from your development team. And, and the comment was that that only works if, if your management is actually instructing the developers to do so. Um, I, <laughs> who, wrote, who wrote forcibly inserted? <laughs> I'm not going to give you a chocolate. <laughs> Because that is terrible phrasing. No, no, mine, 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 was the, mine was the conduct violation. I didn't do the forcibly. No, no, no. It's the, it's the lady behind you. No, no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling you out individually now. Please, please turn that into plain English for me and I, I will give you a chocolate. <laughs> I, I, maybe it's time for me to have a rant about plain English. So it's really, really easy. And especially, um, has everyone in the room been to university? Been to university or college? Some kind of tertiary education? Does this count? Yeah, okay, let's go. <laughs> okay, so, so most of you have been to some kind of tertiary education of some description. And it's really, really easy when you're at uni to, to learn how to write in this amazingly wordy kind of way. And that's because we're writing up to word limits. I don't know about you, but when I used to get my assignments in uni, I'd go, oh, 5,000 words. And I'd go home and start typing madly because I'd get 5,000 words. And then you'd watch the word count at the bottom. And as you got closer, eventually, then you'd stop. And you'd go back. And occasionally, if you were a bit short, you'd sort of split them out a little and, and added a few more words into your sentence. Yes. Oh, engineering word limits are apparently max, so you can tell I didn't do an eng degree, huh? <laughs> okay, who wrote the admonition? That would be me. <laughs> that was a distinct ploy to get a chocolate, Absolutely. wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> who wrote about being punny? <laughs> no one's admitting to being punny? No? Fine. It could, it could be people doing it remotely too, I absolutely, in which case if you're doing it remotely you don't get a chocolate. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I was talking about plain English. So yeah, in, in university we write up to these, to these word limits. In tech writing, with every single edit pass that you do through your document, you should get 20% shorter. And, and so of course the obvious gag is you do five edit passes and you run out of document. Um, oh, we've, we've run to the end of our screen. Okay, you under sprint. How are we going for time? What, Ten minutes? Okay, tools down. Tools down. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, who's, who's our who's our scrum master? Sorry. Sorry, I actually ran this through my shirt, and it turned out to be a bad okay. idea. Well, you just have to come closer. Do you want to come around over here? I've got a code of conduct violation going on here. <laughs> so we were lucky enough to have a couple of experts on uh, penguin vehicle design with us, and uh, we managed to uh, get a lot of insights on how other cultures are doing it as well. Um, and so now what we have here is actually pretty much the prototype in Beta Vehicle. You can see the three penguins seated uh, snug with their eggs. Um, it's warm and nice in there. There's a little bit of ventilation going on. Um, we have UV shielding and power generation. And because... <laughs> 
taking notes of this, right? And because um, of the cooperation with the uh, international group of experts that we had, we have been able to probably, this is, this is, it's as good as a promise, but don't, you know, don't hold my word for it right now, been able to increase the maximum speed that this can go at to 1.2 meters per hour. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, is there any other questions we need to ask our development team before we, quick, quick did we decide we had 10 minutes left? 10? Excellent. How many budget points are we allocating to this? <laughs> I, was going to, I was going to try not to go into that whole section of Agile. Like one, one laptop per child budget, all right? Yes, very, very little. How is the vehicle? Solar. It's solar power. Solar. Yeah. Also gravity. Gravity power. Gravity. Yep. <laughs> gravity and solar, if you didn't get that. So what I might do is actually we'll just have a, a, a I'll slightly shorten the sprint. We might have an eight minute sprint so we can finish in time. Um, so for the third sprint, what I would like you to focus on, considering we, we already have quite a lot of concepts and tasks, I'd like you to focus on polishing and ensuring that things are correct. What do you do with the notes? You know, when you've got a note that you want to so travels up to one point two hey, where did it go? Travels up to one point two meters per hour as a feature. Yes. Concept. Yes, that's a concept. And then I put a little disclaimer up the top there. I'm I'm aiming to put a little note down the bottom of it. But where do you actually place it? There it is, under features. See how it's got a little box next to it? Ah, yes. Okay, so there's, there's several ways you can do this. If you were doing something like a release note or something like that, a series of dot points can work really well. I personally try to avoid them. Uh, usually if you're in the concept part of a document, you've got a fairly lengthy document, you can actually devote a paragraph or so to each feature. So in, in the real world, not in this situation obviously, I would probably actually go through and research enough about that and actually in, in, if you can work it in, almost do like a use case. So if you're in this particular development environment or whatever, then this particular feature can help you out in this particular way. Um, I might also add at this point I have a marketing degree. So <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, it really is a marketing thing. Um, a lot of the, the concept information, even in very technical documents, are often read by CTOs and CFOs. And I, I refer to them as our, our forgotten audiences. We tend to talk about our audiences, especially with highly technical documentation, about being our, our technical audiences. They're our sysadmins and they're our developers. But there is also this unspoken audience that tend to read technical documents as well. And they're the people who are making the financial decisions. They're the, 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 the senior management types who are trying to work out if they're going to invest in this product, they're going to install this particular thing, and if they're actually going to, to spend their budget on it. So it's really important to make sure that there, there is a little bit in there for them too and you're presenting your, your product in a very positive light. Obviously you don't want to go into a whole heap of marketing spin because that's just going to turn people off. But it's really important that you use very simple, very, very plain, I shouldn't say simple, very plain language and that you're, you're promoting the features of it in a very concise and easy to, easy to consume way. And that's for those, those hidden audience members. How are we going? I've got more chocolates left. I should be handing out more chocolates. <laughs> Do you need more chocolates, development team? Yes. The, the, develop, the, the development team needs to be needs to be powered further by chocolate. The mummy penguins are out. The mummy penguins are off getting food, and the daddy penguins look after the eggs. I know this because I have a ten-year-old daughter. <laughs> So how are we going with our polishing? Oh, flux capacity. Who wrote about flux capacity? Thank you, Mr. Davies. <laughs> Does that even get fed back to the development team now? The flux capacity. Ideally, actually, so. The response was 1.21 gigawatts. It's, yeah. <laughs> so it's it's in, it's entirely possible that we could do it. We could do a request for feature at this point. Requests for features do come from development from documentation teams. And, um, but also, the other interesting part about it is not just requests for features, but bugs. Documentation teams pick up heaps of bugs, and this is why it's really good to keep your documentation team on side. Like, in other words, feed us more chocolate, right? It's, it's because as we're going through stuff, we're testing things, we're actually clicking all those buttons, and we're acting like a noob user, which, because half the time that's exactly what we are. 
um, then we're actually finding all those things that aren't working quite as expected. And it's not necessarily if you click a box that something fails to happen. It's that it might click a box and do something unexpected. It's not, it might be the way you, you designed it, but it might be unexpected from a user perspective. Yes? We're done before demo. My goodness. <laughs> Can I have a round of applause for the development team, please? First project ever that comes in before time. Exactly. It came in on before time, under budget, and we only we, we spent maybe we might have overspent a little on the chocolate. Yeah. Yeah. How many penguin casualties was that? Zero. Zero penguin casualties. Nice work, well done. How many penguins are actually in the vehicle? That's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> 1.21. One, one point two one. That's it. Excellent. So I, I think at this point we can probably wrap it up. We've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, if there are any other questions from the audience that I haven't addressed yet, I'm more than happy to do so. I've got more chocolate too, so feel free to grab one on your way out. I yes. Asked you if, this, if this would actually be happening in the real world, and you said yes, but would it actually happen where anonymous people are contributing to the same document, or would they be talking to each other? So the, so the question is about would this happen with anonymous people? And I have to say more or less, yes, that's what open source is all about. And open source documentation in particular. I, uh, I interact with heaps and heaps of people in, in a document, in a very large distributed documentation team. And while I might have Twitter handles or, 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 or bug sign in names or something like that, I don't know these people. I, I have no idea what their background is. I haven't hired them. I don't know what their resume looks like. I don't know whether they're developers or writers or whether they've just decided that they've got something cool to say. So yes, absolutely, An anonymous or more or less anonymous stuff does definitely happen. I'm sorry? So this is what when it comes down to con continuous integration. So I work on the OpenStack project a lot, and um, so we've got uh, we've got the, the Jenkins and Jarrett system, and and so yeah, you get reviews through through that way. So things do get through do have to go through a gate. Who reviews the Jenkins does not review your documentation. Who reviews it? There's a core team. There's a core team that reviews. So there is someone who says. Yes, we'll check uh, it's not an individual person. No, it's a team. Okay. In exactly in the same way that code code is contributed to open source documentation, open source um, okay. projects. Um, open source documentation does work more or less in exactly the same way. I love that you've continued. Okay, who wrote the sword? There's a company for that with the five penguins. We didn't bother that. Oh, sorry, that was terrible. Not part of the you don't mind. Oh, God, I'm getting worse. Did you get worse? Worse, I got worse. I don't know if I can get that far. <laughs> Anyway, so thank you very much to my documentation team. I hope you've all enjoyed being a, a, a documentation team for an afternoon if you don't normally do this as your day job. I hope you learnt something. I hope you got something out of this and you can go back and tell your boss that yes, you went to that documentation talk, talk and, and, and you got something out of it. Um, if you do want more information, please feel free to contact me. I also want to very quickly do a little plug for myself. I am working on a book at the moment about agile documentation. If you do have an Agile documentation story, I would love to hear from you. If you work in an Agile documentation, if you work in a documentation team that is doing Agile stuff badly or well, I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to interview you and, and have a section on you in my book. Um, so yeah, that's my plug. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. <laughs>